And good evening, everyone. It is good to be back on a Wednesday night with, uh, with you guys. Yeah, thank you, thank you. It's good to be back. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I, I understand while I was away, and I will confess, I have not taken time to listen to them yet, but don't feel bad because I haven't taken time to listen to my wife's first service while I was, uh, while, while I was gone as well. But I understand Kathy, my wife's comment was Kathy did an excellent job, and then she said my only regret with Mike is that he didn't have more time to talk about what he was talking about. So uh, I am looking forward to listening to those, just haven't had the opportunity yet, but it's good to be back with you on a Wednesday night. It's been a while. Just a reminder before I forget, next Wednesday, we will not be having Wednesday evening service due to the fact that Apostle David Juma will be here Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. So if you guys can come out next week, uh, Sunday night, 6 o'clock, Monday, Tuesday, 6.30, uh, and that, that, of course, will be in the sanctuary. But um, I encourage you, you know, bring somebody with you and just to come on out and enjoy the presence of the Lord. So how many appreciate God? <clears throat> Hopefully that's every one of us, right? <clears throat> We appreciate the Lord, appreciate him being with us. And uh, of course, uh, Jordan, good to have Jordan home with us from Bible College. And uh, <coughs> yeah, that, that's enough. All right, <coughs> I don't appreciate it that much. You are right, some good, good. It keeps him humble. So anyway, so glad to be back with you guys. And we want to open up in prayer as always. And uh, just appreciate you guys so very, very much. Kathy, would you lead us in prayer tonight? Heavenly Father, we're always so grateful that we have opportunity to gather together, to be here with brothers and sisters in the Lord. We're thankful for the gift of Chris that you've put in our church, Father, and, and his, his leadership, his pastoring, his teaching. We thank you, Father God, for your word that you've given us to, as we read it and study it and talk about it, that we get revelation understanding yes. through your Holy Spirit. So open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts tonight, Lord God. Speak through Pastor Chris mm -hmm. so that we'll receive yes. the message that you have for us mm -hmm. in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 He that has an ear, let him what? Hear. Hear. Hear what the Spirit says, not what the pastor says, not what the teacher says, the prophet says. Let him hear what the Spirit says, and that's what we want to do tonight. Before we get into tonight's lesson, I'm going to be doing a th similar theme to what we did uh, a few weeks ago. It, it's hard to believe it's been almost a month since I've taught on a Wednesday night. It was, uh, let's see, today's the, what, 18th? 17th, 17th. It was, it was uh, April 19th, the last time I was here on a Wednesday service. So it's hard to believe it's been almost a month. But uh, a month ago, we did this, the little sermon, a little teaching called uh, Stewarding the Voice. Listening to the voice of the Lord. And tonight I want to kind of pick up on that theme and in just a moment talk about stewarding the presence. And it's not so much a, a, a series that we're doing, but I do want to do that tonight with you. Before I get into that, though, a number of you were out for Sunday school on Sunday uh, to hear just my little presentation on our trip. And it was just a blur of details as I, I was throwing at, at, out at you. But uh, any questions you guys thought of that you want to ask before we get into it, the lesson tonight about, about uh, our trip? Those, those are... I have a tan. Yeah, and actually, I think, uh, besides my son, Jordan, who was comparing tans with me, uh, you're the first one that said anything about that. But uh, we, we were out in the sun a lot. Thankfully, it wasn't, we, we, we drove so much. We probably drove on a bus, rode on a bus probably, I'm guessing, probably about 2,000 miles uh, in, in those, in those uh, that two, two weeks. Uh, we flew a lot too, but uh, but driving a lot as well. So we, we were in and out of the, in and out of the bus, but uh, when we were, out in it, we didn't have any rain, didn't see, the first, first five, six days, we didn't see one cloud. Um, Egypt and Jordan, we didn't see one cloud. It wasn't until Israel to get to see a cloud. How was it doing the devotionals for unfamiliar faces, all those people? It, how was it doing the devotional for, for uh, all the unfamiliar faces? The first day I got there, I, 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 I was really honored to do the devotions, and uh, I had two devotions that I actually did not get to share. Uh, so I was kind of bummed about that because I, I put a lot of work into those and those are kind of like the kickoff going to the promised land because literally we were on the exodus tour we were on the, the the going from Cairo Egypt all the way up through into the promised land and that was our scheduled tour with this Christian group um, so two of those I didn't get to do so then the first one that I did get to do uh, the first three I think two or three were actually on the bus yeah, and yeah, and, and so I, I'm telling you, if you've ever tried to read something while you're standing up on a bus, uh, it, was, it was like one of these kind of things. And, and, so, and, and I was doing it to people that I just met or hadn't even met yet. 
And so it's tricky because, you know, they don't know me and all that feeling out things and they don't know my style or uh, all, all of those things. So, so it was a little awkward, but uh, probably after, once I think, I think that once I started doing the devotions outside of the bus, uh, it made it a little easier there getting, and I, and I, I think it took me, uh, I think the first two devotions, I, I didn't really use any humor. And then the next, I think the third one, I opened up with a joke and then that just kind of loosened people up as well. But, but I was honored. I, I was telling Lucinda, you know, I got to speak literally on the Red Sea. I wasn't walking, but I, uh, on the Red Sea, but I did get to speak literally on the Red Sea, got to speak in two caves. Uh, I got to, one of the caves being the shepherd's cave, shepherd's field uh, in Bethlehem. Uh, got to speak uh, outside of the garden tomb. Uh, we had a nice time there. The presence of the Lord was just ministering to us there and got to speak uh, at the Jordan River and we had a great time with that. And, um, and I baptized about 10 people, baptized my son Andrew as well. Um, so, so it was an encouraging, encouraging time all the way around. So, so. What's that? I got to float in the Dead Sea. Yeah. How, Mike, did you ever get to the Dead Sea? Never been, yeah. Uh, weird experience. I didn't talk, talk too much about that on Sunday, but uh, it, it was like bathing and ba- it was like laying in baby oil. It really was. It, it was. it was a weird feeling that you just lay there. You, you can't sink. As a matter of fact, it, was, it wasn't like tough, tough, but it was like, you know, if you're in the water, if you're swimming, you're like, okay, I've got to stand up. Now you put your feet down and you stand up. Uh, you had to concentrate. Say, I got to put my feet down, Chris. Put your feet down, you know. <laughs> and it, it was tricky to get your feet down in that, but it was a cool experience. And you you didn't want to taste the water because the water was uh, pretty nasty. They say if you drink it, you could die. So we we're, were cautious not to drink it. So uh, so any anyone else? Just any thoughts before we get into the lesson tonight? Uh, Cindy, did it make you feel like you were working, or did you like it make, make you feel like I was what working, or was it like a vacation? It definitely wasn't a vacation. Um, it wasn't, definitely wasn't your, your typical vacation, which uh, uh, it, was, it was just different. Hey, Josh, welcome. Um, it, yeah, it's not like it was going to a beach and saying, hey, uh, you know, I'm going to lay back, take it easy for a week. Um, the, the devotion, you know, I, it was one of those things, you know me, I'm not, I don't need to be seen, but yet I wanted to have you guys share this experience with us. So the, the videos we put on Facebook, that would take us between Andrew and I, it'd probably take us 45 minutes to an hour each night to get those done. And, and the internet at the hotels wasn't always great, or sometimes we didn't have, you know, Wi-Fi at the hotel. Um, and then uh, the devotions I had, about eight of those done so by the time we landed in Cairo. Um, but then the others, you know, a couple of nights, it was like late nights just trying to get those done. Um, so, so it wasn't a vacation. And, and then some of the some of the stress of, not, not wasn't bad, but doing kind of the pastoral leader thing with the guides as well. So it was, it was, it was good. Did you have any type of scares from there was shelling and stuff over there? Was that anywhere near you? Well, not, not really. Um, for those of you who didn't catch the news over there, you know, when we're back here in the United States, the Middle East conflicts, that's just something we just kind of tune out. But when you're there, it's a little bit different. Um, to lead into that question, I think I mentioned this on Sunday, our Israeli tour guide, we had an Egyptian guide, a, a um, Jordan guide, Jordanian guide, and an, Egy- an Israeli guide. Our Israeli guy, who was a Russian, excuse me, mess- Messianic Christian Russian Jew who had immigrated in when he was 17, now 52 years old, um, because all Israelis, men and women alike, unless you're Arab, serve in the military, um, Israelis were not allowed to go into um, Palestinian territory. Uh, under threat of their lives. So he didn't go in. So that was always something that you're always kind of aware of is that, you know, they have signs and as soon as you enter in, Israelis aren't welcome and your your life could be in danger. So I mean, there's just threats. It's just threats. Um, But then we left, Andrew and I flew out on a Thursday. So Tuesday was when Israel uh, sent rockets in, missiles in to uh, kill Islamic terrorists. Uh, and they did get some of those, but they also got some, some women and children that were probably in the vicinity with these terrorists, which you know, sounded very unfortunate, of course, but that's, you know, you hang out with bad people, that's, that's possibly happened. Well, then, that was on the Gaza Strip. Well, then they retaliated, and uh, they sent hundreds of rockets towards Israel. And if, if any of you guys are familiar with Israel's Iron Dome, uh, it's just an impressive, impressive set. It's anti, anti-missile systems, what it is, but... Um, I was reading once a number of months ago, watching a video on it a number of months ago, and it, it's not a literal dome, but it's, as soon as missiles are launched, they pick it up and they'll shoot them down. But the Hamas or 
uh, Hezbollah or any of these terrorist organizations can take and send a missile in for like thirty thousand, fifty thousand dollars, whatever it might take, uh, or less. But then the the Iron Dome, every time they use that, it, it's almost like a million dollar per um, per rocket to take them down. Now they're effective, but uh, it's it's still expensive to do that. But you, you just live on that. So so the we we were supposed to fly out. Well, we did. We flew out on Thursday. There was a number of people who were going to be leaving our tour group on Wednesday. Um, and some of those flights got delayed a couple of days because of that, because they were shooting towards Tel Aviv and we were flying out of the Tel Aviv airport. So never really felt I was in danger. And, you know, we prayed, Cindy been praying and I've been praying and, and, you know, whatever happens, happens. And, but at the same time, uh, you, you have the, you know, faith in God, but also the common sense that the airport airplanes never been shot, shot down over there. But those, those are always thoughts. So living in the Middle East, it's just a matter of, that's just part of daily life, you know. In the in Tel Aviv airport, they have bomb, bomb shelters that you can go into in case there are bomb raids. So, yeah. Cindy Lou? But the Iron Dome was down, I think, before you guys went to Israel, right when you were first there. It was down for a well, little bit. Was it really? I was praying. Okay, thank you. I appreciate the prayers. Yeah. Yeah. Had I, had I known the Iron Dome was down, maybe I'd be a little more concerned. So. How was the foods over there? Well, my wife and I and Andrew, we were kind of teasing because if you guys know me, I'm, I'm a fussy eater. You've heard I'm not a big fruits and vegetables eater, and we were going down through the menu of what they had. And so I, Cindy and I, we went out shopping before I left, and we bought extra snacks, just more granola bar kind of stuff, you know. And, uh, and, but I tell you what, I, I, I was never so pleased to be so wrong with my thoughts. I, I'm telling you, Egypt, which I didn't realize at the time was a third world, is a third world nation. But the hotel we stayed at, every, every, every hotel we stayed at, had buffets that were, I, 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 I've never seen anything. Some of you who may have been to Las Vegas at hotels there, I think that's probably, I haven't been there, but I think that's probably the closest that I can think. They, they had spreads, not, not so much of every kinds of meats, but what they had just in abundance and fruits and vegetables. And they, like in Israel, they would serve salad for breakfast and, and all the fixings and, and ve- you know, you, you name it almost, it was there. Um, so it was just amazing. I ate a lot of rice. I'll put it that way. They didn't have like bacon. I missed my bacon in Israel, but uh, they they did have a lot of rice. So I ate a lot of rice and they had potatoes and I ate quite a bit of that, but uh, they had lots of meats. And so it, it was surprising. We were just shocked the food. I mean, and I won't pull it up, but Andrew had a little bit more pictures of food than what I had. Just, just, I mean, just amazing. I mean, you put these, these tables here would be a typical hotel uh, it, it wouldn't be, it'd be more than this, a, a typical hotel. So, I mean, it was just amazing. And, and of course, they were feeding hundreds of people too. So, a lot of tour groups. So, anyway, anyone else before we get started? Charlie? I've heard a lot of comments about riding a camel. And how it smells. It didn't smell. I mean, we were, we were out in the wild, but I don't know. <laughs> it wasn't comfortable after a while, I'll tell you that. So, um, yeah, the saddles, the saddle just... For all you men out there, I'll just put it this way. The saddles could have been a lot bigger. I'll put it that way. So they, they could have been a lot bigger. Um, but yeah, they... <laughs> and, did Andrew mention on Sunday his camel stumbling? Did he mention that? No, no, he yeah, he, yeah, yeah, he had a camel named Whiskey. And, uh, <laughs> and his camel stumbled three times on him. Um, now the camels were real dangerous because we were going up Sinai, Mount Sinai, the traditional Mount Sinai. Uh, and... Uh, and uh, they, they, don't, they would only go two-thirds of the way up, and then we had to hike the rest of the way up, which we did. But uh, uh, it, it was a little dangerous because we had the Bedouin guides that would be guiding the camel along beside you as they walk. Uh, but they didn't let you know when, 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 when the ride was over, you know, you know, you pull into the parking lot with the camels, and you knew it was time to get off. But next thing you know, the camel goes like that. And, you know, down on its knees, they, don't, they didn't tell you, like, you know, hold on, because the camel, you know. Uh, another camel ride some people took along the way. They, they were at least nice enough to say, all right, now when the camel dismount, you know. But the, these ones were dangerous because you, you, you didn't know they were getting off. So, <laughs> they, were, so they, didn't, they didn't, I don't know, they didn't smell. I mean, but anyone else before we get into it? Yeah, Bonnie. I've never heard how you even got involved in this tour. Uh, yeah, at the risk of embarrassing Andrew, it was a it was Christmas present from him. And oh. Cindy and I paid some towards it afterwards, but uh, he'd been wanting to do it and he just... He gave Cindy the option to go to, and she, she decided not to, which is fine, but, uh, but that, that's kind of how we, I say Andrew, and Andrew primarily, and uh, Nathan I think helped, and Jordan, but uh, mostly Andrew, and so we just, Jordan, Jordan says no. <laughs> he, he's a poor college student, he wanted to help, so. Um, 
they they did give actually a pretty pretty substantial discount. Um, uh, I think overall, I think it was like an eight hundred thousand dollar discount because I was a pastor for the two of us. So, <clears throat> so so yeah. So now, as a result, they said, you know, but we'll ask you to do some devotions and too, stuff like that too, and help out. And uh, so yeah. So I was I was honored again. I was honored to be involved. I mean, how often do you get to speak at the Garden Tomb or the Jordan River, Sea of Galilee? Um, what's that? Or baptized in the Jordan River, yeah. Um, so, you know, in Caesarea Philippi, I get to speak up there. Speak on the Mount of Olives. You know, how cool is that? So. Will I ever go back again? I think uh, if the, people have asked me that, uh, I'm not saying this is an ultimatum, but probably the only reason I would go back is if, if there was a church group from our church that wanted to go sometime and we put together a group and go, I, I would go. Um, would I want to go back? I, I've pretty much seen everything I would have wanted to see. And I was listening to a, a, a minister, a Calvary Chapel minister I, I listened to online. Listening to him last week a little bit. And, and uh, he was, it was actually he was on our way back from New York City. I was listening to, to satellite radio. And he was preaching and, and uh, Skip Heltzig, I think his name is. But he said, yeah, he said, they're planning another trip in 2024. He says, I, I've gone over about 40 times. And I'm like, my goodness, 40 times. I mean, once was, once was enough for me. Uh, the, the airline, we had, it, was, it was tedious going through the airline. Turkey, the Turkey airport's a beautiful airport. Uh, brand new, two, 2019 just opened up. But we, we had to walk, 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 walk. It, it, was, it was about a half mile walk to get to the transfer. What do they call it? Transfer, international transfers. And then we had to walk about a half mile back. Um, and then when Andrew and I first were going over, we missed our connecting flight, which was fine, worked out well. But we walked about three miles in the airport just to try and get everything sorted out. So, so those kind of things, just tedious. Anyway, any, anyone else before we get into it? Because you guys didn't come to hear about this, although I, it's interesting, but at the same time, we came to hear the Word of God. So, all right, would you look at somebody and say, pay attention, it's time for the Word of God. <laughs> That's right, John. John, do me a favor. Keep Bonnie awake tonight, okay? <laughs> that Bonnie. Yeah, yeah, that Bonnie. <clears throat> yeah, yes. Didn't you miss any of us? Like, we missed you guys. Well, if, if you had been in church on Sunday, you would have heard me say, I'm teasing. But but I, I, I did mention how, how much I did miss you guys. I'm teasing, of course. Uh, he live streamed. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, good. Uh, but no, it, it is. It's. I. You know. I. I had a, a church over there. About forty-five people. I was speaking to. But. Uh, you know. It's. It's like. It's like leaving the kids at home. I did hear some of the first part of Cindy's sermon. Like she said. You know. Um, I missed her more than she missed me. And what she yeah. meant by that was true. Is the fact that. You know. I, I'd love to have all of you guys with us. What's that? You heard that. I heard that. <laughs> <laughs> Because you said it in the first ten minutes, so <laughs> then, then after that I listen. Uh, but you know, it's like you know, you have friends and loved ones, and what do you want to do with loved ones? You want to share experiences with them. <clears throat> um, and then when it comes to cases like this, where it's spiritual experiences and biblical experiences, of course. So yeah, no, I, I did miss the church because it, it's as much as that church family we had was nice, and we we really did have some good people that I'm missing, and, and I'm thankful for Facebook because I can. It, it's tough. You, you get to know these people for two weeks, really learn to love and appreciate them, and then next thing you know, they're out of their lives, most likely for till, till eternity. Um, but through Facebook, at least, I can stay connected with some people, so that's good. So, but yeah, no, I did miss you guys. I wish you were there with me. Now, how many would ever want, not, I'm not saying, I'm not taking up a, a, collect, a poll now, but how many would ever want to go to Israel? Let me see your hands. Yeah, oh, just about all of you guys. That's impressive. Anybody here says you wouldn't want to go to Israel? Just a couple of you? No, yeah, a few, yeah. Well, it's not Israel, it's overseas period. Yeah, overseas period. Yeah. Overseas period. yeah. Uh, let me put it this way. If you keep serving God, though, one day you're going to Jerusalem, all right? Amen. Yeah. It'll be safer than... It will be much safer than... You got that right. Well, I, I had asked... I do a lot of my thing in the mornings, and I had asked the group to pray for you. To keep Thank you. <laughs> one lady wrote back, and she goes, do you not know that Israel's the safest place on earth? Yeah. It's God's place. It's God's... I, I may have told you this... Uh, I may not have to. I can't remember before I left. <clears throat> a number of years ago, probably 10 plus years ago, Benjamin Netanyahu, who, who was the prime minister, who was the prime minister, now is the prime minister again. He was speaking to, it was either the United Nations or some, something in the United States anyway. And uh, there was more 
tension going on at that point in time. And he says, look, he said, people are concerned about their safety. And he said, over here in the United States, he said, people are concerned about their safety. And I tell them, look, if you want to be safe, he said, just get out of JFK. And once you're out of JFK, you'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought that was humorous because, you know, it, it is. It's, it's, uh, JFK was, was interesting in itself. So anyway. All right. Yes, Mary. I noticed you haven't said anything about the bathrooms. Um, <laughs> the... Well, nor normally I don't say much about bathrooms, to be honest with you, but, but no, um, let, me, let me go backwards. Israel, no problems, they're fine. Um, e Egypt and uh, Jordan, uh, the, the, the one thing that drove me crazy is the, the, the tipping situation. Um, in, in Israel, in, in, rather in Egypt and Jordan, um, if you want to go in and use the bathroom, you've got to usually pay somebody to, to go in and it's a, somebody standing at the door. Uh, even even at when I landed in the Cairo airport, um, Andrew had gone and used the restroom, and then while we were waiting for our luggage with the guy that met us there, uh, so then I got my luggage. Well, it took about another ten minutes for Andrew to get his luggage, so I went to use the restroom, and uh, so guy's standing out the restroom door, and I go in use the restroom and and go to wash my hands, and then he hands me a towel. It's like you know, <coughs> paper for towel, hands me a towel. So I, you know, I gave him a couple of do dollar or two, but it's it's just it is interesting there. Uh, I will say this without going into much detail. Mount Sinai is the worst outhouse I've ever used in my life. I'll just put it that way. I'll just leave it at the back. Well, I've been to Morocco, and they have when you go in there, and there's a spot under your feet, and a hole in the Yeah. That, 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 was, yeah. that, that was essentially Mount Sinai. So, All right. Here we go in the Matthew 28. Many of you are familiar with Matthew 28. It says this, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the what? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, notice what he says, I am with you how long? Always. I am with you always even to the end of the age. The message paraphrase puts it this way. I will be with you as you do this day after day after day, right up to the what? Once again, li listen closely. Jesus told his followers <coughs> that he would be with them for how long? Always. Always. He would go with them. He would be there for them. He wouldn't leave them. All the way to the end of the age, all the way to the end of time, he would be there. But I have a question for you. When in Jesus' ministry did Jesus speak those words? Anyone remember? No? No, this was just before the ascension, wasn't it? It was literally right before he left them. What don't you think about that? I'll go, I, I'm going to be with you guys forever. Bye. Bye. I, I, it's like Jesus said, you know, guys, listen to me. I'm never, ever going to leave you, but I'm leaving you now. Then he ascends to heaven, leaving them staring at the sky. Now, you and I, with hindsight, kind of understand what Jesus was talking about, but... It, it had to have been at least slightly confusing for the disciples. Never going to leave you as he's going up into heaven. You've been learning through the years, whether here or elsewhere, uh, you, you've been learning through the years that even though Jesus was going to be leaving them physically, he would be abiding with them through the spiritual presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 16, notice what Jesus said. And I apologize, I'm going to be doing a little more talking than interacting tonight, but if you have a question or thoughts, please feel free to, to, to uh, interrupt. John chapter 16, Jesus told his disciples, I tell you the truth, it is to your what? Advantage, Advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the help, helper will not come to you, but if I depart, I will send him to you. Before we go on to the next verse, <coughs> you've, you've heard me talk about this before perhaps, but again, the disciples are hearing, it, it's to our advantage that you go away. Jesus, you've been with us now for over three years. <clears throat> We've been blessed by your ministry. 
Why was it Jesus said, it's to your advantage that I go away? What do you think? Strengthen your faith. <clears throat> okay, strengthen faith. That's that's a good possibility. It's good. What else? Kathy? Because the Holy Spirit can be in each one of us wherever we go, and Jesus, in physical form, as a human, doesn't need to be beside us. Okay. Because he can't go with everybody everywhere. I agree 100%. Let me ask this. Was Jesus limited at all on earth? No. Yes. Why? Because he lived in a human body. Lived in a human body. And for the most part, he could minister to one person at a time. Now, I'm sure exceptions, of course. But if Pastor Josiah, again, Pastor Josiah, thank you for helping facilitate things while I was gone. Didn't he do a good job? Yes, he did. <laughs> But Jesus was limited. So Pastor Josiah wants to pray for somebody. Typically, he can pray for everybody, but specifically, he can pray for one person at a time. Jesus was limited. He said, it's to your advantage I go away. The Holy Spirit's going to be able to flow through all of you. Now, along with that as well, what else? And we're going to look at this tonight, so I, at the risk of jumping ahead. What is it about the Holy Spirit that took place? What is it about the Holy Spirit that took place within the believers that didn't take place prior to Jesus' ascension. What happened? The well, the gifts of the Spirit. But the Holy Spirit took up residence. And again, I'm going to touch on this later, so I don't want to jump too far ahead. But he said, it's to your advantage I go away, because what the disciples did is they operated under the power of the Holy Spirit. But once the Holy Spirit came to them, because they were now alive, their spirit was now alive, the Holy Spirit now dwelt with them, and they were able to flow. Notice John 15. Jesus said, When the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will do what? Testify of me. <clears throat> uh, forgive me for going on a little rant here. Some of you heard me rant about this here. But, but through the years, the church has often become negligent concerning the complete activity of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. Now, the older I get, and maybe it's just because I'm now north of, of 50 and I'm becoming more of the get-off-my-lawn kind of guy, but, but it kind of bugs me when I hear the Holy Spirit referred to as the third person of the Trinity. Yeah. Now, now, I understand from the Bible, we seem to be more familiar with the concept of God the Father and God the Son, but you, you, you do realize that the Holy Spirit was mentioned before we hear about the Father or the Son? Mm -hmm. Do you realize that the reason you're saved here tonight is because the Holy Spirit is the one who has illuminated the truth of Jesus to you? Yeah. Do, you do you realize that Jesus walked the earth 2,000 years ago in physical form, and according to Scripture, He hasn't been back since in a human body, but for the last two millennia, the power of the Holy Spirit has been growing and empowering the church. Yet, we refer to him as the third person of the Trinity. I, I almost want to start my own campaign for us to start referring to the Holy Spirit as the first person of the Trinity. In my mind, I can almost hear someone saying, blasphemy, blasphemy. But in referring to the Holy Spirit as the third person of the Trinity, it's almost as if we value him less. It, it's almost as, we, as if we value him as not as important, as insignificant and irrelevant. But I'd like to remind you tonight as we get into this lesson, um, stewarding the presence, that the Holy Spirit is not greater than the Father, and he's not less than the Father either. He's not greater than the Son, Jesus, and he's not less than the Son. He is an equal part of the Godhead that needs our attention. Without his ministry in your life, none of you would be saved here today. Not one of us. Without his breath breathing into your life, you would still be dead in your sins. With, without his power touching and anointing your life, there's not one person who would be serving Jesus tonight. According to the Bible, and just listen for a moment, the Holy Spirit is the breath that will give you life. He has a mind, he has a will, he is a spiritual person, he's all-knowing, all-powerful, omnipresent, sovereign, and he's eternal. He's holy, righteous, loving, gracious, merciful, and truthful. He speaks to people, he searches hearts, 
He can be grieved. He can be tested. He can be resisted. He convicts of sin. He testifies of Jesus. He's called to come alongside you and help you. He makes us more like Jesus. He illuminates the truth of God's word. He calls you to ministry. He empowers you for service. He gives you boldness. He helps you pray. He guides your life. He baptizes, he dwells, and he fills. He's the giver of spiritual gifts. And the Bible refers to him as the spirit of God, the spirit of Christ, the spirit of truth, the spirit of grace, the spirit of glory, the spirit of life, the spirit of wisdom and revelation, the spirit of promise, adoption, holiness, and the spirit of faith. And the Bible pictures him as the living water, the anointing oil, a dove, wind, fire, and as a guarantee of our inheritance. Now, can somebody repeat that back to me? So tonight I'd like to take a a few moments and have us kind of discuss how we can properly steward. We we talked about stewardship a couple of weeks ago, just briefly. Steward is like managing, right? Managing someone else's property. How can we properly steward the presence of of this Holy Spirit that we're talking about? And and please understand, I, I don't mean that we can manage the Holy Spirit, how many know that, that, that we can't manage the Holy Spirit? But, but how do we learn to carefully and respectfully handle the Holy Spirit? And I, and I even hate to say, handle the Holy Spirit. Uh, because it, it, it almost implies that this powerful, this dynamic, this, this all-encompassing force can be handled by mere mortals like you and me. But how many know that's not possible? Bill Johnson has a book that probably comes closest to the way I think we should carefully treat the Holy Spirit. He has a book called Hosting the Presence. And and since he wrote the book before I did my teaching, I can't use his title tonight. Otherwise, I'd probably use it. But so instead, we get to uh, talk about stewarding the presence. Question for you tonight. How would you describe the difference between the Holy Spirit being omnipresent versus manifesting his presence? or him manifesting his presence. How, how would you describe that difference? We, we know he's omnipresent. What's that mean? That means all present. We, the Holy Spirit's everywhere. David said in Psalm 139, where can I go from your presence? If I were to go to the heart of the earth, you're there. You, we, we just can't escape him. You know, it's like you know, when you're trying to run away from God, understand God's always with you. you. You just can't do it. You can't run from an omnipresent God. But there's a difference between him being omnipresent and the manifestation of the presence. It's not a hard question, perhaps, but how would you describe it? What's the difference? Makes himself known. Makes himself known, okay. Someone else? Mike, thanks for volunteering. <laughs> he, just, he just wants to live his, his life through us. And mm-hmm. I had a guy one time was teaching and he was from a farm background and all that and everything. his examples were very earthy and what he was saying like um, like a culvert go running onto a road and if it's all plugged up with rocks and leaves and sticks it's it's useless and then it's just gonna wipe out but and that's that was his whole message was being culverts for Christ. Being culverts for Christ. Just yeah. letting the Holy Spirit live his life through us. Yeah. This made perfect sense to me. Let it flow. Sure. Good. Anyone else? Cindy? I think of his uh, omnipresence is part of who he is. It's just his character. His character. It's, it's who he is. He is everywhere. But when I think of him manifesting his presence, it's what he chooses to do personally to reveal himself mm-hmm. to us. So it's more his character of who he is and what he does. Yep. Keeping good. it simple. Very good. Josiah? Uh, I would say maybe a crude example would be like the concept of electricity. And that when you have wires running through your building, there's always electricity in those cables. Mm-hmm. But the manifestation of that electricity is when you complete the circuit and the light bulb comes on. Yeah. Turn the light on. And the, the power is always there. But until you interact with it, and Good. you don't see what it can do. Nice. I like that. Sort of the same thing with the Holy Spirit to some extent. Yep. This next parenthetical is not original with me. I just found this. I'd never heard it put this way before, but I thought, um, 
everywhere presence, omnipresence, manifest presence, on me presence. Cute way to look at that. You've heard me say perhaps that Jesus in himself did not do anything. Luke chapter 4, the Spirit of the Lord is what? Upon me, he said. Jesus was a holy man, lived a holy life, but he only did what his Father did as he was empowered by the Holy Spirit. The same power that Jesus worked in is available to us. Now that's not saying we're wop- it's not saying that any of us are going to operate with the same power and authority that he did, but because the Holy Spirit was the same Holy Spirit that worked through Jesus, and it's the same Spirit that works through us, we have that power at our disposal. Now, we're not going to go in tonight to working in authority and faith tonight, but that's something to keep in mind. Manifest presence, it's the on me presence. Now, studying the Holy Spirit would be exhausted. We could be here for, for months. But there are three truths, truths regarding the Holy Spirit that Jesus shared that I'd like to highlight with you tonight. And number one is this. The Holy Spirit is an extra. And I want you to just kind of notice uh, these three points, EX. He is the extraordinary helper for you. He's the extraordinary helper for you. Notice John 14. I will pray the Father and he will give you what? Another helper that he may abide with you forever. I want you to keep in mind, uh, you, you may have heard me talk about this and I'm just going to be redundant for a moment in a, in a, in a moment. But uh, I want to just look at Albert Barnes. Bible commentator Albert Barnes says this. Jesus, Jesus is speaking this prior to, this is on the night of his, crucif- night, night of his arrest. And uh, he's telling his disciples this, but notice what he says. Albert Barnes says, Jesus had been to them a counselor, a guide, a friend while he was with them. Agreed, right? He had instructed them, had borne with their prejudices and ignorance. He had administered consolation to them in times of despondency. But he was about to leave them now to go alone into an unfriendly world. The other comforter, another comforter, was to be given as a compensation for his absence or to perform the offices towards them, which he would have done if he had remained personally with them. And from this, listen to what Albert Barnes says, from this we may learn in part what is the office of the Spirit. So in other words, what what we saw Jesus do is in essence, what the Holy Spirit is going to do. Uh, To quote Bill Johnson one more time, Cindy and I have talked about this before, but Bill Johnson says that Jesus is perfect theology. What we see Jesus do, he didn't do anything that was uh, against theology. Here you see Jesus doing things, perfect theology, but now the Holy Spirit is going to be replicating what Jesus did because he's the other helper. From this we may learn in part what is the office of the Spirit. He says, it is to furnish to all Christians. How many are part of the all Christians here tonight? is to furnish to all Christians the instruction and consolation which would be given by the personal presence of Jesus. I want to take a moment and highlight the word helper in verse 16. Um, Anybody at this point looking at any other versions besides New King James or anyway? NIV. NIV. What's the NIV say? I'm sorry, you may not have it there. John 14, 16? Yes. You got it? And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. All right, all right. another counselor. Um, all right, no, notice what I have on the screen here. Thank you, Bonnie. Uh, New King James Version and the English Standard Version use the word helper. The NIV, New Living Translation, use the word counselor. King James Version uses the word that many of us cut our teeth on, comforter. Mm-hmm. Um, the uh, New Revised Standard Version uses the word advocate, and the message paraphrase uses the word friend. Now... How many think that might sound a little confusing? All right. Anybody? Now, at, at first, some people might be tempted to be, to be critical and think that the Bible translators can't be all that smart, right? Uh, you know, after all, if they can't translate one word from Greek into English. But, but the, the word uh, that is used here is the word parakletos. And listen closely to what I'm about to say. It has no English equivalent. The word parakletos, and I'm going to talk about that here in a second, it has no English equivalent. Uh, The word comes from two other Greek words, para, alongside, and kaleo, meaning to call. Now, Mike, one of the things, and again, I apologize, I've not listened to your teaching from the other night, I want to, but my wife said that, how how did you word it? Instead of loving with all your heart in your culture, you loved with all of your what? Your liver. Your liver. 
Um, I don't know, that just doesn't have quite the same connotation, right? <laughs> in American culture, but yet that's the way you convey it. So we understand that languages aren't always clearly, clear, clearly translated or transliterated. <clears throat> Therefore, per, parakletos, um, it, it, again, it comes from two Greek words, meaning para, meaning alongside, and kaleo, to call. Hello! You know, that's to call. So it is, the whole, Jesus said, I'm sending you another parakletos. I'm sending you someone to come alongside and help. But Jesus didn't say what that helper was going to be doing. He just said, I'm going to be sending you a person called to come alongside you. Well, why is that person coming alongside you? Well, this is where Bible translators are trying to figure out. Well, he, it, it's to comfort. Well, no, it, it's to help. Um, oh, no, it, it's to be a comforter. It's to be a friend. It's to be an advocate. It's a, it's a helper. Why? Because that's the context is Jesus saying it's someone coming alongside of you who's coming from heaven. So inference is, is here. And, and to say that the Holy Spirit is a friend is true. How many know the Holy Spirit's a friend? Yes. But it's incomplete. So the message paraphrase says he's a friend, but, but it's incomplete because the parakletos is more than that, right? How many know the Holy Spirit is more than a friend? Um, is the Holy Spirit an advocate, someone who helps in that way? Sure. It's also true, but it's probably reading too much into the word, if we're, we're honest with the translation here. Um, comforter is for comforting, but it's definitely not an exhaustive translation of the word. To say that the Holy Spirit is a counselor or a helper is good, but again, it's only an inference and it isn't fully backed up by the context of John 14. And, and helper almost always makes it sound like the Holy Spirit is available to undergird and support our plans instead of him reminding us of Jesus' words. So, so we see all of these translations um, transliterations up here of the words, but, but it still falls short of who the Holy Spirit is and can be for us. He's someone who's called alongside to dot, dot, dot. Regardless of which of those words you use, you're, you're going to be falling short, falling short with getting the complete picture. But I do want you to understand that he is called to be the one to come beside you, to help you out in whichever way you need it. Now, now notice, uh, some of you have heard me use this illustration before, but okay, I'll just keep the camera there, I'll be right back. But uh, I have here in my hand a stool, um, what we might call a chair, you know, since this is a stool, we call it a stool. Now, is this a chair? Yes, right? Yeah. It is a chair. Um, now, is, is this a chair as well? Yes. All right, so we have, we have both chairs here. But are they the same kind of chair? No. no, they're different. But if I were to take this chair and grab another one, of, another one of the brown chairs, we'd have another chair of the same kind. Well, in Greek language, <clears throat> there are two words for uh, another, allos meaning of the same kind, another of the same kind, and heteros meaning <clears throat> another of a different kind. For instance, the Greek word like we think of heterosexual, that means a man likes a woman the way it should be, vice versa, right? But it's, it's an other kind. It's another of a different kind. Um, the, the, the Holy Spirit is another of the same kind. When Jesus said, another is coming, it's another of the same kind. Jesus said, I was a helper. I was a counselor. I was a comforter. I was a friend. I was the one called alongside you. I was the one. But I want you to know, guys, there's another of the same kind going to be coming. He's going to look like me, he's going to act like me, and he's going to lead you into doing the same thing. So it's an extraordinary helper coming alongside you. Now, God has given me a wonderful wife. Somebody say amen. Uh, God's given me a wonderful wife, and the Bible lets me know she's a help meet, she's a helper. But yet, how many know you can't get a helper like the Holy Spirit? You can't get a counselor, a friend. There's nobody like the Holy Spirit. Again, Jesus said, guys, I'm never going to leave you. I'll be with you always, but... See ya. But what happens? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit was left with us to be the one we need at our time of need. The one that we can use at our time of need. Now second, second truth uh, from Jesus concerning the Holy Spirit is this. The Holy Spirit has been given exclusively to you. Notice, notice um, John 14, 16 and following. I will pray the Father, he will give you another helper that he may abide with you for how long? Forever. Forever. Notice verse 17. 
the spirit of truth whom the world, what? Cannot receive. I, I want you to notice, uh, this is underlined here, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him. Would you look at somebody tonight and say, you know him. You know him. <laughs> now, you may not know the Holy Spirit as well as you'd like to. You may not know the Holy Spirit as well as other people in this room, but you know him. Uh, by the upper raised hand, and please just, just humor me on this. You've heard me kind of go this route before. But how many of you know that you're born again tonight? Let me see your hands, please. All right. <clears throat> how did you get saved? Lots of work. Lots of work. From whom? From Jesus. The Spirit. You have to... I'm just going to cut you off right there. The Spirit. The Holy Spirit led each one of you to Christ. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians... The natural man does not understand the things of God, for they are spiritually discerned. Every one of you tonight who is a born-again follower of Christ, and that's all of us, I believe, tonight, guess what? It's because we've gotten to know the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Through the years now, we've gotten to know Him better. We still don't know Him like we should, but we've gotten to know Him better. Now, <clears throat> I, I struggled slightly saying the, the point here. The Holy Spirit has be, been, been given exclusively to you because... <coughs> Excuse me. When something is given exclusively to you, generally that means that only a very select few people have been given that opportunity. But, but when Jesus said, you know him, the word you in Greek is, is a plural pronoun, meaning you all, or maybe Jesus was a southerner and he said y'all. Y'all know him. All y'all. All y'all know him. So he's talking to his disciples and he's looking at them except for you, Judas, um, you know, no, no, but, but he's, no, even Judas, I believe, knew him. But he said, you all know him. Why was that? Because they had operated in this power of the Spirit. Today, if Jesus were teaching here tonight, and I'd be in favor of that, <coughs> Jesus could look at you people who are followers of, of him and say, friends, you have the privilege of experiencing the helping power of the Holy Spirit yourselves. The world doesn't have this privilege, only you. You and, and all the followers of me, only you have that privilege because this world is blind and ignorant to him and his ministry. But you, since you know me, you all know him. I want to say that last part one more time. Jesus would be saying, since you all know me, you know him. That is why. Because we have been, been sensitive to Jesus. We've been sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus wasn't leaving his disciples without someone to continually bear witness to what Jesus had taught. It, it, it would have been one thing for, for Jesus to ascend to heaven and not given them any power. But the Holy Spirit's role was to bear witness. It was to, to back up what Jesus had said. That's why when Peter and John entered into the gate beautiful, they said, silver and gold have I none, but what I do have I give unto you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Nazareth, rise up and walk, and this guy got up and walked. Why? Because the Holy Spirit was confirming the words of Jesus to the people. Paul and others, they moved with that power, and it bore witness of what Jesus had taught. Now, uh, allow me to, for a moment to go to an Old Testament uh, antecedent, if I can use that word, um, regarding God's presence. When, when God called Moses to leave Mount Sinai to get up into the promised land, um, God at first told them, basically, can I put it in the Chris Gray paraphrase version? Yeah. God basically said, Moses, I want you to know I'm ticked off with all of you guys. <coughs> basically, they just built the calf and Mount Sinai and all that happened. And he's like, look, he said, I'm going to send an angel up there. He's going to take care of all the, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the, all the other parasites, all of those things. And they're going to uh, be destroyed, but I'm not going with you. At least not in the intimate way. God's omnipresent. But again, the omnipresent versus the manifest presence. Moses, I'm going with you, but I'm going to let the angel do it. And I want you to listen to Moses' response here. <laughs> Moses basically, well, basically Moses said, you know, who shall, who shall I say is sending me? And notice what God said. God said, my What? presence my presence will go with you and i will give you rest so 
God had relented, basically. Then Moses said to him, If your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. For how then will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight, except you go with us? So we shall be separate, your people and I, from all the people who are upon the face of the earth. So the Lord said to Moses, I will do this thing that you have spoken, for you have found grace in my sight, and I know your name. Moses said, God, you're saying that you're not going to go up with us. It's good you're going to send an angel, but look, if you're not going, I'm not going. Lord, if you're going, forget it. I, I'm not going to do it. Moses basically started arguing with God here. Thankfully, the Lord relented, but, but I got thinking about this, and I thought, would it be that, that we were like Moses and recognize how valuably, valuably we need his presence? Yes, there, there's billions of people in the world that don't know Jesus, not, not, not familiar with the Holy Spirit. They're living life, but they're not really living life. Would it be that we wake up in the morning and say, God, I, I, I'm not going to face this world. I'm not leaving the house until I know that I'm walking in the fullness of your presence. We need it. Uh, I don't know about you, but I, probably it's more the men I can talk to here tonight on this because we don't typically carry a purse. Josh, you don't carry a purse, right? No, okay. Sid, Mike, Bob? Are you sure? Okay. <laughs> Three things that I grab in the morning. What are they? Not my purse, no. My phone, my keys, and my, my wallet. And, and you know how it is. It, it's, uh, it, it, it goes, all right, you know, leave the house, all right. Wallet, keys, phone. Wallet, keys, phone. Wallet, keys, phone. How, how many of you guys are like that in the morning? Anybody? Yeah, Chuck, thank you. Thank, yeah, we're like that. Wallet, keys, phone. Wallet, keys, phone. And, and, I, and I thought about doing a teaching on that at some point. You know, the, the wallet represents the, the power, perhaps the phone, the communication, or the keys represent the power. The, the, the um, wallet represents, you know, what we can get throughout the day. And there's spiritual application there. I'm not going to get that tonight. But, but, but you know, what, what I need to be doing, though, is, is, is wallet, keys, phone, Holy Spirit. Wallet, keys, phone, Holy Spirit. And, and eventually maybe I could go, you know, Holy Spirit wallet, keys, phone, you know, get the priorities right. But would it be that, like Moses, we say, Lord, I'm not leaving this place today until I know that your presence is going with me. Yeah. I, I, I just know as pastor, there, there's things that, that I, I, I do that I, I can't answer on my own. I need the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Now, today, you, you have to understand, and I think many of you do, welcome, guys, you have to understand that the Holy Spirit has been made exclusively available to you who are born again. Would you look at somebody and say, the Holy Spirit is for you? So, so I'm just, catch, catch this little nuance. The Holy Spirit is for you, but the Holy Spirit is for you. All right? Did you catch that little nuance? Uh, I always remember Cindy and I, I'm, I'm going to go on a rabbit trail for a moment, but Cindy and I always liked this little expression I learned years ago. Um, just the way all the nuance on words. I didn't say he stole money. I, did, I didn't say he stole money, or I didn't say he stole money, or I didn't say he stole money, I didn't say he stole money, or I didn't say he stole money. The nuance changes every time. But I want you to understand, the Holy Spirit is for you, but the Holy Spirit is for you. He is for you, and he's for you. Why? Because Jesus said, I'm leaving. It's to your advantage I go away. People at Greater Valley Assembly of God, Jesus left this world, but he didn't leave you as an orphan. He gave you another, called alongside to help. Called, we, we, you know, was he called alongside to be a helper? Yeah, but he's called alongside to also uh, counsel, to comfort, all those things. But he's, he, he's that with us. So today, you, you, you can understand, you can't be trying to live your life without his presence. Why, why are you trying to be a Christian? Why are you trying to be a Christ follower without listening to his guidance? Uh, listen, as a pastor, I'm not smart enough. I'm not talented enough. I'm definitely not good enough looking. I know that. To adequately pastor this congregation, let alone take care of my own life, my own spiritual needs, I need, you need the guidance and the counsel of the Holy Spirit. 
I forget, I, I fail, I fall, I flounder on my own. I need the power of someone who's called to come alongside me. Another helper or whatever word you want to use there. Another parakletos uh, to come along and help me out. The one who's called to come alongside. So, so, so third is this. Three truths from Jesus. Third, the Holy Spirit no longer simply dwells externally around you. And notice the last part of verse uh, 17, chapter 14. But you know him, he dwells with you, and he will be where? Hard concept for people in the world to understand. Sometimes a hard concept for people in the church to understand. If you have a job outside of the church, you know, working at Guthrie or McDonald's or wherever you might be working or college or somewhere, you go to work and you talk to some of your unsafe people. You're like, man, had a great ride, ride into work this morning. Really? How come? Man, I, I, was, I was talking with God and the Holy Spirit who lives inside of me. He spoke to me and he told me, uh, gave me some assurances and promises that I really needed to hear. How are they going to respond to you? You're a fruit loop, loop right? Yeah. <laughs> Woohoo. Why? Because again, the, the idea of a supernatural spirit communicating with me in, in the world, typically when the world talks about supernatural spirits, it's, it's a lot of times watching horror movies. You know, they recognize there's a demonic world. They, they may even believe in the devil. But to think that the Holy Spirit is a personal being, part of the Godhead that wants to dwell in you and with you. There, now, there are a lot of people who are spiritual, They'll say, well, there's some sort of force or power or energy out there. You know, dealing with the gentleman I mentioned before in volleyball, you know, he's like, man, there's energy out there, dude. You know, man, and there's energy. But, but, but again, not to go too deep here, but John 1, in the beginning was the what? The Word. word. That, that word is logos. And, and again, I've mentioned in the Greek-Roman culture, there was a logos. They believed there was this mystical force out there that was spoken and holding the world together and, and everything together. It was all part of this word. John comes on the scene and says, I want to tell you guys, in the beginning, there was this, this mystical form, this logos. But I'm telling you, the logos was with God and the logos was God. We beheld his glory. Um, the glory is the only begotten of the Son. Um, the word became what? Flesh and dwelt among us. So it's the power of the Holy Spirit that now today helps us to understand the things of God. But the, the, the disciples, as, as many of you are aware, <clears throat> they operated, yeah, praise God, yeah. They, they operated with the power of the Spirit coming upon them. So um, it, uh, just Pastor Josiah, come on up here, if you will, please. <clears throat> <clears throat> All right, now, Josiah, we're going to pretend here that this, this chair weighs 200 pounds, okay? So come over with I me. Now, I, I, you know what? I, I came back after my trip, after th uh, two and a half, three weeks of not seeing him. Saw him the other day in his t-shirt. I said, man, I said, you're bulking up. Have you noticed he's bulking up? He's bulking up. So, what's that? <clears throat> All right, you keep thinking that, Debbie. Thank you. <clears throat> anointed, anointed ice son. I like that. Now, so here's a pound that weighs, what do we say, 500 pounds, all right? So he can't, he can't do 500 pounds. So I am representing the Holy Spirit here. Holy Spirit says, Josiah, pick up the chair. He can't do it. He can't, he can't do it. All right. So then, but the Holy Spirit now comes alongside him, and then together we pick up the chair. Now, you can put it back down. Now, in a very crude illustration, this is the way the disciples did ministry, not to pick up chairs, but... But the Holy Spirit did ministry as it came alongside to help them. 